Hi, and welcome to Gardner Live. I'm Heather Pemberton Levy, and today I'm joined by Adriana Fucuse, who is a senior director in Gardner's HR research practice. She's going to talk to us about future of work trends. Hi, Adriana. Hi, Heather. Great speaking with you today. Thanks for being here. Now, future of work is something that's on a lot of people's minds, especially given everything that's going on in business and globally today. So let's start with some context about future of work during this time of disruption. Can you talk about that? Absolutely. So we have been moving from an initial stage of response and trying to cope with a shock that the pandemic uh, gave and now moving more to, toward a uh, reset and, and recover. And the workforce, the workplace are being pressured to change by these unprecedented and radical forces from COVID-19 and on health and safety, new measures to protect employees on the site and to help employees work from home or learn from home. And the rapid acceleration of digital trends that all changing business models faster than ever. And, and the economic fallout from the pandemic, and more recently, the demand for greater equity in the workplace and society. So those forces are driving fundamental and long-lasting changes in the way we work, who gets the work done, and where work gets the work. Absolutely. And we're going to get to talking about some of these specific future of work trends, but I want to let our audience know that we will be taking your questions later in the broadcast. So you can post them in the comments section and Adriana will answer them in a little bit. So let's break down and talk about some of the specific work trends. And one of them that certainly all business leaders have been dealing with is this move to remote work. Is that a lasting change? We think so, and our data shows that uh, pre-pandemic, we had about 30% of employees working remotely, and now it's going to be increasing to up to close to 50% of employees working remotely, either full-time or part-time. But that will create uh, a mix of employees who are working remotely, employees who are working on site, and employees who uh, do a little bit of both, so creating a hybrid workforce. And of course, that generates a lot of implications for leaders, for organizations, in terms of how we do workforce planning, how we think of managing employee engagement and the experience of employees, and how we drive performance. Right. And that's what I actually wanted to focus some more of the interview on, which is, what do these future of work trends mean for business leaders, right? Because there's a lot that, that business leaders now need to accommodate as they think about planning for remote work, for leading teams, for all of the implications of this new work environment and, and what that will look like. So let's break some of those down. I think you, you talked about uh, workforce planning. Is this about skills? Is this about end-to-end -end strategic planning of the workforce? Can, can you break that down a little bit? Absolutely. So the first thing to consider is this, the time span of workforce planning has changed. We used to be able to plan three to five years ahead, sometimes even up to 10 years ahead, given emerging trends and uh, technology and other social and demographic trends. But now that time span has been shortened. Um, the fast pace of change has changed what we used to plan for three to five years now is maybe a 12 month plan. And what used to be a 12 month plan is now maybe a six week plan trying to cope with uh, what we have in front of us. So leaders will need to focus both on the critical skills we need in the short term. So digital skills to be able to work remotely and to be able to work with distributed teams across distributed work when employees will be working from different uh, locations. And also focus on the medium and long-term skills that we need given the evolving and emerging trends in their industry due to artificial intelligence, robotics, uh, again, digitalization and uh, other changes that are happening in critical roles and critical skills. We're also seeing reskilling and upskilling around the enterprise, aren't we? As, as employees shift and move and employers are more agile with what they're doing with the workforce. 
Exactly. We have heard so much uh, leaders that I talk to tell me we have been forced to be agile, even without having an agile methodology or doing it properly. Uh, we have been forced to create solutions for problems that we need to solve immediately. And that has led to an acceleration of initiatives uh, leading to a more resilient org design, more resilient way to think about um, how we define roles not by a set of skills, but by ways in which individuals can pivot to uh, other parts of the organization. And uh, we, we see a lot of redeployment and talent share, sharing internally to cope with the changes in demand and changes in the operating model that require that we shift resourcing and, and skills from one part of the organization to another, or even external talent sharing. So uh, absolutely a more agile and, and flexible and resilient workforce through these uh, more nimble workforce planning practices. It's almost as if, you know, this might have been a future of work trend forecasted farther out, but like many things, the pandemic is pulling it forward because we all have to operate in new ways just because of the circumstances. Um, let's talk a little bit about something else I think you mentioned, which is the employee experience. And that's, you know, part of reskilling and that impacts it, but I'm sure there are other areas that are impacted because of employee experience. How are leaders and HR leaders thinking about that? So we hear so much about the employee experience changing and the employee journey. If you think about pre-pandemic, the employee journey started the minute you walked into the office, maybe nine o'clock, and it ended as you left the office. Now the employee experience encompasses the home office situation for those who are working remotely. Uh, do I have adequate uh, technology? Is my workplace safe, ergonomic? Um, how am I being supported to be effective and stay safe in, in a remote environment? And if for on-site employees, how am I feeling and being safe, not just during the working hours, but also during the commutes to the workplace? So the employee journey now is spanning those uh, environments at home and in the commute that before weren't part of what we thought of the employee experience. And, and how we take into account employee preferences when it comes to restrictions lifting and our ability to open up more workplaces, that will be uh, important and, you know, in, in the decisions that we make in terms of who works where and um, how we enable individuals to work from different locations. I can imagine that this is what employers are in the thick of right now. Is, is that whole return to workplace uh, effort, right? And, and, there's, and, they're, and they have to deal with a constantly changing environment, right? So they're trying to plan, they've been laying plans for it, and then everything's in constant flux. It must be really challenging. It is, and if you think of now having a, a mixed workforce or hybrid workforce where uh, some employees might be collaborating in person and some employees might be working remotely, out of sight and potentially out of mind. So really leaders need to think of uh, new inclusion strategies where we integrate and engage employees regardless of where they're working from. And we find ways for employees to connect to others to build and strengthen their, their networks through technology. Um, some tell us that they've been doing you know, office hours with a manager, or an open door policy on, on, on an instant chat. Um, virtual coffee breaks, fitness breaks, uh, happy hours, you name it. Different options for different employees to connect with others in the organization, both professionally and socially, but also to feel connected to their manager, to their colleagues, and to the organizational culture. Right, and those inclusion strategies become increasingly so important with this changing workforce. Let's move on to employee performance. And I, you know, early on in the pandemic, I was speaking with your colleague, Brian Kropp, about that. And there were some studies about employee performance, you know, for, for folks who work from home, you know, it was pretty strong. Where are we today as we think about employee performance, especially moving forward? So we see a couple of different things. On the one hand, uh, studies had shown that remote work was leading to uh, effective performance and remote employees would be indeed more effective 
because they have fewer interruptions, fewer distractions, and they were able to focus on their work. But what happened after some employees were suddenly uh, forced to work remotely is that sometimes that e extra performance led to longer working hours and the uh, expectation of working around the clock, right? Not knowing to turn you know, the laptop off at the end of the day or a certain time. That has uh, been managed. And, and I think today most employees um, have been able to resolve that, but we still hear in, in some geographies in particular that there's the expectation that, well, you have nothing better to do. So, uh, you know, I expect you to answer emails at 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. Mm -hmm. So that has been one of the aspects of the increased performance that can lead to um, potentially burnout. And, uh, and the, on the other hand, we do hear companies that tell me, you know, I was expecting my employee to bring me an update this morning and it's already the afternoon and I haven't heard from them. What should I do? And you ask, well, what you, would you have done if you had been in the same office? And they said, well, I would walk to, to their desk and ask, how's it going? And then they realize we need to replicate those connections remotely. We need to be able to uh, have a, informal conversations to see if the employee needs help or if there's a new priority that came up or or what's happening. Um, because otherwise, what we also hear is the difficulty of managing performance when we can't see employees. So the trend that we had already seen of moving performance from episodic once or twice a year to really ongoing manager employee conversations that are open-ended where we set clear goals that can be flexible because things are changing but that we can assess against those goals and against outcomes and not necessarily activity how many hours you are in front of your computer uh, that is true more than ever for both on-site remote and even hybrid employees. And, and managers need to also seek feedback from multiple sources to really make sure they're capturing what the employee is contributing and not just the, the activity or, or the tasks that they're completing uh, from the manager's point of view. So it's so important and it's, and it's the initiative is critical to translate what worked in the office to remote work. And, and you think that the digital tools could easily do that. Is there is there a gap between how digital tools are being used for this type of remote performance management? We see about 16% of organizations incorporating tools that track from you know strokes that employees type, the time that they're online, even through their webcam if they're indeed in front of their desks or tracking expressions and and um, all sorts of, of tracking of activity. And whilst this has been, you know, a measure of performance or one way to measure output in some uh, roles, it can be uh, misleading because what we really want to track is output. And what the pandemic has shown for employees who um, started working from home is that they could work at their peak productivity times, which could be in the morning, the afternoon, the evening, right. or they can work around their other commitments, which could entail uh, childcare, could entail going buy groceries for elderly parents and dropping them off in the middle of the day, or other complexities that this environment has uh, forced us into. So having that flexibility, having that empathy and that conversation between manager and employee to really make sure we have clear goals that we're measuring against and we're not just tracking activity. Right. That's great. We are going to take our viewer questions in just a few minutes. We have a few coming in. So if you have any, please post them in the comment section. Uh, now, one of the things you talked about was employee mm -hmm. burnout and the risk for that. So uh, how does the notion of employee wellness and experience translate and and where is that in, in a trend as far as future of work? So that's another trend that's accelerated. We had already seen more awareness of not just physical wellness, but mental wellness. And we had seen some companies starting to create a chief mental health officer, a, a 
uh, head of wellness. And, and we had seen an increase in, in wellness practices, wellness benefits provided uh, to employees. With the pandemic, the role of employers as a social safety net in providing increased wellness benefits, increased benefits to support employees' uh, health and well-being, such as uh, extended sick pay or backup dependent care or um, assistance programs, mental health uh, support and training for managers in terms of you are no longer able to spot the signs of uh, a mental health issue because you can't see the employee arriving late or looking upset. How do you uh, track those possible red flags when you can't see an employee who's working remotely or when we can't uh, see expressions so much because we're wearing protective equipment or we're social distancing? So those are some initiatives that we've seen, again, accelerated uh, in the past few months, employers are doing their best to try to protect their employees, try to support their employees, and, and becoming that social safety net that uh, we had seen as a slower trend in the past. That's great. That's great to hear. All right, we do have a few questions that have come in, so I'm going to move to them. Great. The first, the first one is Yvette from New York asks. What does your research say about the productivity metrics for virtual versus in the office? Uh, thank you for the question, Yvette. And we, we see that there are applications that are tracking productivity metrics. And again, for some roles where we are tracking, you know, number of calls made, number of minutes spent talking to uh, customers or um, other roles where activity does give us an idea of productivity uh, for other roles this is not the case and for virtual employees that communication with managers is more important than ever and we have lost the ability to bump into each other in the hallway or uh in in the coffee break or have an impromptu conversation uh, setting up a call sounds too formal when i just want to ask a little question or i just want to check in so that's where we see that uh, the uh, setting up of office hours and open door um, instant message policy between manager and employee and, and really having that conversation. What is the cadence in which we should speak? Maybe for a newer employee, they prefer to speak once a week, twice a week, even more regularly. For uh, other employees, that might be equivalent to over supervision, micromanagement. And for others, that might be too little and too little direction to guidance. So for virtual employees, we have to be more proactive in creating these spaces for managers and employees to connect. Whereas for on-site employees, managers are sometimes better able to observe and uh, have performance discussions, informal performance discussions. But in, in both cases, we do recommend that ongoing performance management, where we have ongoing frequent conversations where we discuss progress against goals, any changes in, in goals, new goals that have emerged or, or moved uh, in a different direction. And then looking at employees providing their own input as to what uh, co contributions they've made. We see an increase in employee-led performance conversations where employees can bring to the conversation their contributions, their uh, successes and how they've worked with and through others to uh you know create value and um and bring that feedback from others that the managers can then um seek uh separately but but that ongoing performance management works for both uh virtual and on-site employees just uh with uh a need to be more proactive with virtual employees interesting okay our second question from Leah from Texas asks, what might some of the changes in org design be in large complex organizations? Are you seeing any trends there? Yeah, so in, in large complex organizations, one of the things we're seeing in is the, the need to uh, design roles for resiliency, for uh, effectiveness, and not just for efficiency. So some of the organization redesign efforts that we've seen in the past have led to uh, squeezing the last drop of the orange. And uh, that has led us to not being very flexible and agile when we need to shift to 
uh, new ways of working as uh, we have had to in the past uh, few months. So uh, we see that in large uh, organizations, complexity will increase. We see in, in this uh, type of financial crisis that uh, M&A increases, that uh, things like nationalization and uh, other you know, organizational level complexities can impact the, the workplace and the need to rethink uh, and, and reorganize uh, roles. And um, open source change management here is uh, as important as ever in taking into account employee uh, points of view when we're looking at change management, uh, bringing in the right employees at the right time in the right way so not bringing everyone else at once for every decision, but trying to think, how do I uh, integrate and include employees so that we can make the decisions that are going to um, help us be more agile, more flexible, more resilient? That makes sense. Okay, this is, this is a good one. Julian from London asks, how many companies have you seen do you think will adopt a four-day work week? Uh, yeah, great question. And I uh, have heard some organizations do it, uh, both from a need to optimize costs, a need to uh, avoid, uh, you know, other measures that might entail, you know, layoffs or furloughs, and, and asking employees to volunteer uh, a reduction in, in working hours, resulting in a, in a four hour, uh, four, four day working week. And, um, so that's one uh, area where we've seen that happen and to try to protect as many employees financial well-being and, and jobs as possible um, and uh, another um, area where we've seen that is where we are trying to help employees help attract employees who might have a preference for uh, flexible work which might entail flexible hours or reduced working hours that has been a trend that's been on the increase, especially as we try to increase the diversity in our leadership ranks. And so some of those tactics can help um, women, particularly who at, at, at some stages might need to have more flexible uh, working hours and, and to help them progress in the organization. Um, and then, you know, others are uh, opting for that as a way to uh, increase productivity because they have seen that their employees can do their work in, in four days and need the, the three day rest. Uh, so, so that's some, some of the trends that we're seeing. Okay, that's good to hear. Jacqueline from Kenya asks, with the agile environment currently experienced by organizations, would you say it's an ideal period to implement strategies, especially digitalization? Well, this is something that has been accelerated dramatically. I mean, many companies have been forced to digitalize, right? So if you think of uh, some companies in retail where they've had to create an online uh, platform if they didn't have one or if they didn't have a very good one because they can otherwise sell their product. So in many cases, uh, libraries, for example, having to, uh, you know, serve their uh, their clients through, you know, uh, curbside pickup and, and things like that. And, and online has uh, become more the um, more of the business model compared to physical pickup. Right. So in any organization, digitalization has been forced to uh, accelerate. So there's definitely the need to think of how do we um, create the environment where we can enable that digitalization to happen. Maybe it is uh, reskilling some of our uh, part of our workforce to shift to, you know, online services or online marketing, um, cybersecurity and, and things like that. And, uh, and the pandemic has uh, in many cases accelerated and others forced the digitalization um, of certain uh, organizations. Right. Right, there's so much there. And we have many colleagues in our IT practice and the other practices who can who can go on for hours about all of the ramifications there. But I think the people are such a big part of it that that reskilling and upskilling is certainly important. Okay, Kelly from Texas says, 
For jobs where the interaction used to be significant for building new connections, is there a way to move it to virtual? And I think this is on a lot of people's minds. As you go to remote work, what are you giving up potentially? And how do you move that digitally? I know my team is using lots of digital tools to foster quick conversations and chats and video calls. You know, how is how is how does that not work for some or, or are there struggles that you're seeing? Yeah, certainly not all roles can be done remotely and some can be done remotely, but at a cost. So roles where interaction is the key driver of um, a positive outcome, like maybe sales, um, that we have to make some adjustments uh, if we are to be effective remotely. But surprisingly, uh, our data shows that employees who work remotely have more connections than employees who don't. Um, and if we think about the unbounded workforce where we can connect with anywhere, anyone anywhere in the world at no cost, this has reduced the, the distance and our ability to connect dramatically. So if we have the right technology, the right tools, if we have the right uh, digital skill set and digital ambition in, on the part of our employees and we uh, have the right training for digital skills, as well as effective collaboration capabilities, then um, working virtually should uh, be able to, you know, help employees connect with uh, whomever they need to to get the work done. But again, some jobs might need uh, some accommodation and, and some interactions. Um, I, I don't know what uh, roles you're thinking of, but some interactions definitely in person. Um, work a little better than than virtually <laughs> right okay our last question james from virginia asks how is the role of learning and development as an employee benefit or opportunity changing within the current environment and i'm so glad you asked because learning and development was another area that we saw an increase in digitalization. Um, there was a, a, an article recently this, that was talking about uh, MOOCs, the massive online uh, training platforms, and uh, the revival of MOOCs, the revival of uh, remote learning. In some, uh, in some instances, organizations were able to uh, invest in learning and development and, and shift the time that employees had where you know, operations were shut down to uh, learn and develop new skills. So we did see a dramatic acceleration of online learning, of uh, new innovations in learning. And uh, in many cases, the ability for employees to spend more time on learning and development because the, the shutdown allowed us to uh, to stop and, and do that. And, and it continues to be a key part of the employer value proposition, a key part of why employees choose to join an organization, but particularly stay in an organization, is when employees know that uh, their company is investing in them, is helping them develop their skills, their career, and not doing so is one of the key drivers of uh, of attrition of employees leaving an organization because they didn't see the lack of development opportunities, the lack of career progression. So it's uh, more important than ever, and it, it's changed to uh, more of learning and development through digital platforms as opposed to the traditional classroom learning that is not happening during the current period in, in most cases. Right, that's good to know and so important as you, as you made a point of. Listen, it's been great to hear your insights to understand better the future of work trends, but also to get a lot of additional insights on what's happening for employees and employers and business leaders as they manage this new environment. Thank you so much, Adriana. Thank you, Heather. And thank you all for joining us. If you would like more information and to dig deeper into the research behind us, behind this uh, interview, you can download the guide to understand how the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted the future of work. The information is, is in this post. You can also visit Smarter with Gartner and read the nine future of work trends or just search for Gartner Future of Work. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you soon.